The Ryan Turbidy Show on RTE Radio 1 with Vodafone Simply Broadband. All the fibre broadband you want, none of the landline costs you don't. Before me sits a cosmetic doctor, Patrick Tracy. And Patrick, if you don't know him, is medical director of the Aylesbury Clinic. Has branches in Dublin and Cork, London and the Middle East as far flung. And he's led an intriguing life, which he reveals in his new autobiography, Behind the Mask. And in the book, he discusses celebrity clients and friends like the late Michael Jackson, who we heard from earlier on and from in a musical sense. Uh, and But there's a lot more to Patrick's story, I think, than just uh, befriending the Prince of Pop. And that's why we're glad to welcome you to the programme this morning. Thanks for coming in to see us. Oh, thank you for having me, Ryan. Uh, for man to man originally. Exactly. Uh, a happy childhood, would you say, or troubled childhood? A very happy childhood. Grew up on the borders between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Yes. Um, on the banks of um, Loch Melvin. A, a really interesting place. It was where Charlie Chaplin used to come and fish during yeah. the period he fell out, I suppose, with um, Hollywood. American yeah. Hollywood o- over the whole communist era. And um, it was unique as well because Belik Pottery was just three or four miles down the road. And that was one of Northern Ireland's biggest tourist things. So we had youth hostels in the village when I grew up. So I'd be used to when I was 13 or 14, sitting strum and playing Bob Dylan songs yeah. with Americans and Germans. So it was a yeah. very idyllic childhood. And of course, then the Northern Ireland Troubles kicked off. Yeah. Did you get mm. first much first hand experience of the Troubles then? Oh, my God. I, I think we were really in the middle of the war zone. Um, Fermanagh, South Armagh and Belfast is really where it kicked off. So I had this situation, I suppose, in the early 70s where a lot of my neighbours that would be coming into my father's garage would, would be killed. They would have been initially members of the Bay Specials, then the UDR. And I must say, the Catholics in that period did feel a grievance, there's no doubt about it, and felt almost, I suppose, left on their own to deal with things. The South of Ireland sort of turned away from them. And um, there was no doubt about it that during that whole period that uh, it was a different time. Yeah. American civil rights were kicking off and yeah. Catholics in Northern Ireland felt that they were underdogs as well, which of course they were. I mean, you know, in Fermanagh alone, we had... Um, 27 bus drivers and three of them were Catholic and we had I suppose a situation of our town councillors were only sort of you know 10 or 15 percent were Catholic in, in, in a county that had a Catholic majority yes and uh, when uh, it was an awful situation from the point of view that when things started to really go off initially we'd have a situation where my father would be fixing punctures in the garage mm-hmm. and we'd have IRA volunteers in standing beside B special UDR men and when the sort of um, sun went down in the evening they put away their more machines and they took out their guns and started yeah, firing at each yeah. other and you know that would have been it, in, in it, every day, like. even the way you're talking about it was so common to us growing up uh, but it feels like a different country now given what's been happening in, in, in on the island Absolutely, yeah. and we'd have a situation also where we were just across the border from Ballyshannon and Bandoran and when we'd go into the pubs drinking at night time you'd have IRA volunteers coming in from missions yeah. on the run yeah. and you know they would have shot somebody that day and you would have known it you know. I remember going up to South Armagh doing a reports as a younger man and the racket out of the helicopters uh, yes. you know, and, and oh my God. constant Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of window shaking Yes, we, 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 we all live in a prison where certainly you know we were being spied upon by the British Army every day and mm. you know there's no doubt about I have many memories in YouTube videos, actually, you know, of my mother just standing there in helicopter just over her head all day long. It never ended. Absolutely. You, you got into, uh, uh, you went to Queen's. I went to Queen's. And actually, yeah. you studied there uh, and you got involved in student politics. Well, I suppose initially I had won the British Amateur Young Scientist of the Year yes. and I won the Aer Lingus yes. with biochemist when I was still, you know, sort of quite young and, and I wasn't sure what direction to go in. And um, yes, I became president of the Hall's residence. And in that period also, a lot of Catholic students were being targeted. Um, two or three were taken out and killed. And um, we had a situation, I suppose, one day where one of our halls called Allenberg Hall um, had uh, the tricolour hung over it. Now, you've got to remember all the other halls that Union Jacks hanging on them and it was treasonous at that stage just to have a Union or a, another flag flying on that territory and some of our committee members got sent bullets and um, I myself got assaulted I got my legs broken and we had a situation I suppose where it was almost dangerous for me to stay in Northern Ireland and as a consequence my mother who I suppose had grown up in the south of Ireland and a lot of her family were Fianna Fáil um, senators. Um, she thought it was probably Time more to get astute out. for me to, because yeah. um, I wanted to pursue medicine at that stage. Yes. I went to New York, 
spent a wonderful summer in New York with some friends and during that period met Janet Unasis, was chatting for about 20 minutes, met how, John how did you? How did you meet? The... Well, believe it or not, I was working in a place called the Manhattan Plaza and all we were doing was cleaning it before the um, guests all came in. So it was equity actors that stayed there. Yeah. Woody Allen was there. I met Woody <laughs> every morning for Did almost really? two months, you know, Mad. for breakfast, you know. And um, up the street was the Lion Theatre and Jackie was holding a protest to keep it open with only about 20 people. And I wanted to go up to it. My boss, who was from Kerry, says, if you go up, you lose your job, you know. Yeah. So I went up anyway and I started chatting, chatter about Ireland. We went to an hotel, actually, and... Um, I sat chatting for a long time, but when I come back, the boss from Kerry says, what a story like that. We'll have to hold on to you. you And and John Lennon? John Lennon had been in um, Japan and... um, I had a girlfriend at the time in New York who ripped up my ticket home. It was 180 quid and you just couldn't get another one. And I <laughs> She wanted you that, to stay so much. She wanted me to stay, yes. Such was the irresistibility. And I was in that period <laughs> <laughs> about whether to go back to medicine or not, okay, you know. Okay. So I was staying on anyway. So college was going to start for me in the September. This is October, November. Yes. And I uh, met him in Central Park, you know, and uh, he was a nice guy. I had yeah. a talk. And, you know, for somebody that provided one of the soundtracks of my life, for it's sure. a memorable for experience. Sure. And then, so, 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 so poignant the, the monument he only to him. died two or three years after that's that, right yeah. and the little strawberry fields uh, thing yeah. in uh, that Central was a Park. wonderful year as well it was the year that the son of Sam stalked the streets of New yeah, York yeah. Elvis Presley had died Elton John and Kiki D played in Central Park I remember it almost like yesterday yeah fun, yeah. fun, fun and interesting times to say the least but so you you had to come back to college I came back to college and I, I was going to do medicine in Queens but it was very apprehensive about it and then an incident happened in Northern Ireland just outside our house <clears throat> where um, the local bread man was working for um, the UDR and he was gone down with the IRA and I was one of the people that sort of uh, I wouldn't say witnessed the event but it was there you know sort of a couple of minutes after it and um then my mother sort of said, Definitely. "It's time. It's yeah. time." Uh, you went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. Yes, um, it, not not a cheap place to study. So you had to raise the funds, and yeah. you, you came up with uh, some, uh, shall we say, curious uh, fundraising well, methods. Believe it or not, when I went originally, I had my grant in place. Yes, but because I spent some years in Queens, Margaret Thatcher came into power in like seventy nine. Dennis Callan, if you remember, all mm-hmm. the sort of rubbish was in the streets. It was the winter of protest, the winter of discontent. And when Margaret Thatcher came in, she brought in. Kenzie in economics and as a consequence she decided that I could only get six years for medicine and I'd used up the first three you know sort of in Queen's University of Belfast but the problem was she told me in 1981 when I'd already won a lot of gold medals from college and um, I was facing 25,000 a year yeah. so myself and some friends went to Germany to try and collect the funds originally we formed a painting company we were yes. what they called Fenster Striken and um, we but uh, it was obvious we weren't going to get enough funds so my other friends went back to college and I noticed a sort of a scam that sort of the German students were doing that was bringing cars down to Turkey and they could buy a car for a thousand at the time Dutch marks and sell them for four thousand so flip them essentially flipped them. Yeah. and growing up in a border area where we had a situation <laughs> in my carriage where all the customers from Leithram and uh, Donegal would come up with butter to our house yeah. and my father would put on tyres for them and take off made in the UK and that sort of swap went all okay, on the border. Okay. It wasn't a the big extension. The gene followed my, my trick, yeah, the <laughs> yeah. Um, I was intrigued in your book about the your first job as a, a practising surgeon and your collision, for want of a better word, with, with a needle that was potentially... Yeah, that, this, was, this was bad. This was 1987 yes. and um, HIV stalked the land almost like Ebola on steroids. Mm. Everybody thought that if you kissed somebody, you would die from it. Yeah. There was no cure at all. And a 17-year-old came into Blanchestown Hospital one night and um, when I was treating him, um, I had 10 mils of blood uh, sitting on a syringe. That we didn't have the HIV syringe at the time. I needed to do a femoral stab because he was very cyanotic. He probably would have died without tubing him. He was a very mm. severe asthmatic. Mm. And he thought I was going to get another vein. So he turned around and says, there's one here, doc, that he used himself. And he sort of um, fell over. The needle stuck on my leg. And he immediately turned around and says, by the way, I'm HIV positive. So I left it down immediately. I went up to theatre. I got a friend of mine who's an orthopaedic surgeon now to cut a lump out of my leg. I didn't tell him why. I said, consider this like a malignant melanoma. The nurse in charge of theatre came out and she says, when she heard what had happened, she says, you have, my doctor hasn't double gloved. She shut down theatre. She asked me to leave the hospital and um, they moved a hip joint they were doing into another theatre. That was the fear that stalked the land. Yes. In that day also, in the, the, a gastroscope had been burnt yes. because they discovered the patient was HIV and it was a brand new one 
and they cost 23000 So I sort of went back down. I came to the right call of the surgeons. I don't want to mention the doctors involved sure. because their sons and uh, family are still yes. alive. But she told me um, there's 41 needle sticks in the world. Four have been have died, including a girl recently last week in, in, in London. Mm. And of those ones that have died, they're all IVIM. Thankfully, you're not. I said, well, Professor, of course I am. I'm IVIM. And she says, oh, my God, nobody told me that. You're going to die then, most probably, if you look at this factually. So I was in a situation where I knew for the next three or four years I was going to have to get checked four times a year. And this was in the days before antiretroviral drugs. And it, and did you? You had to get checked every, for all the time and yes. for, for for that amount of time. It's quite terrifying in some respects. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you ended up in Baghdad because your life, you're like Zelig almost, you know, because you, you, these mm-hmm. encounters with people and places and times. But there you are in Baghdad in 1990 where they were on the cusp of this invasion of Kuwait, of course, and you were a, a, a locum at the, yeah. uh, in a hospital there. And just before that, I was in the Berlin Wall before it sort of fell and then went straight into the Ibn al in Baghdad. So <laughs> if you remember the Irish run at Tertiary Referral Centre. Yes, yes. And, um, um, Saddam Hussein <clears throat> ruled the country at the time but in that period one of my jobs was getting up at night time to go down to ICU to take blood cultures off three or four times a night which was a sort of a job that, that um, was quite frustrating from the point of view that I suppose nobody wanted the big culture bottles in and all the rest. Mm-hmm. But we noticed that a lot of the patients were coming from Suleimani and uh, from Kurdistan and they were all the Iraqi patients. But the Sunday Times of the period, March the 18th, had turned around and said that uh, he had gassed the Kurds and America originally blamed Iran, as you know. So I suppose being an adventure, I went up into the area and um, there was some months after the event, so there was nothing really there. Mm. But I'd cross into the city with the Peshmerga, which were the freedom fighters. Yes. And on the way, I suppose, back out. And don't forget, I was reporting for the papers at that time as well. And yeah. I had done, you know, a big report on Berlin. And, you know, this was my golden opportunity. Yes. Uh, stuck in the middle of one of the biggest human catastrophes since the Second World War. And um, so I was caught and I was um, put in jail. And <clears throat> how was your jail experience? Uh, well, the taxi driver that was with me probably never um, seen the light of day. At night time, I'd be there listening to people obviously being tortured. And um, the judge gave me a year's jail sentence, but they never seemed to move me from the police station to the <clears throat> jail. And um, Were you so, terrified or stoical? Oh, I, 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 I was... I suppose a mixture of both. One of my biggest problems was the fact that nobody knew I was there because I'd sort of gone up on my own and I was also carrying a license of um, an SM patrol jeep that Fazrov Basrov had originally had because my, my nursing staff health and, and he had been beheaded just in the, in the weeks before that actually. And um, while I was there, one morning a colonel came down, he put a gun beside me on the bed. He said, um, you, you think we're all barbarians? And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, I know James Joyce, I know Trinity College. Is that right? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And he um, roughed me up a little bit, brought me up in front of his colleagues and effectively threw me outside the door and then threw my knapsack out after me. And I turned around and said, well, what about Mohammed? And he just stared me. He never said yeah. anything. He just looked cold. And I walked, made my way back to um, <clears throat> Baghdad, which was 760 miles from where I was, uh, by taxi, phoned up the hospital, got one of my friends to give me my gear, flew to Copenhagen that night. That yeah. was the first sort of um, taxi or the first flight out to Europe. And that was August the 1st. And August the 2nd, I was in the Galway races and it was um, shown on the television that yeah. Saddam had invaded Kuwait. Isn't so amazing? by sheer twist of fate, Ryan, if you can imagine, <laughs> <laughs> all my friends that I thought were free yes. one week before were all now the hostages yeah. that uh, held in the hospital 450 Amazing. and I was the only one that was free. <clears throat> and now we bounce to the, 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 the bizarre you know, the nature of your life, I suppose. Now we head to Michael Jackson. How did you meet Michael Jackson? What were the circumstances of that first encounter? Well, I suppose there are dots along the line. Yes. You know, and one of the dots along the line was when I was free of knowing that I wasn't... I suppose it's going to ever be HIV. Um, I went to Africa and I worked with some of the people yeah. there. And um, the is it difficult for you to talk about this now? Sure. And what is the what is the what what is uh, going on in your mind that that makes well that the difficult? book was cathartic in a way for me. Yeah, I got but, that impression. Yeah, the. Um, 
uh, AIDS was sort of kicking off in Africa, but a lot of, uh, I suppose, white seen it as black man's disease because mm. it followed the route from Zambia down to Johannesburg um, where the copper mines and the trucks were. Mm. And um, in that period, I wrote about it, predicted it, that it was going to spiral and won some awards for sort of my journalism of the period. Um, when I was... Um, uh, doing that, one of the articles I'd written was called The Silence of the Savannah. Yes. And actually, believe it or not, Ryan, I was on your show in 2006. I know. On Top of uh, Tonight. Uh, yes. Yes. And, and when I went back to the office, there was a, a black lady sitting in the office saying, you know, I, I'd like um, you to look after one of my clients. He'd like to meet you and, and be his doctor. She'd seen you on the TV. Is that it? She, or she'd heard about you from the TV? There was an article, I believe, in the Sunday Independent okay. just before it. So she saw mm. you. She came to you and said, I want you to meet a, a, a client of mine. Yes. And off you went to meet. A well, not really. Guest. He was going to arrive at half oh, 10 that okay, night. Coming you know, to you, yeah. And we didn't know who it was. Now, we would see a lot of, uh, I suppose, famous clients in uh, Aylesbury. Only actually last week we had a singer in from, I suppose, Los Angeles that sold. Uh, 250 million records last year. I just seen on one of his things before I came in, and uh, he's a British singer. Yeah, but um, and he so was in for some. W- w- he was in for hair transplant. Hair transplant. Okay. okay. So so we wouldn't uh, be unused to sort of meeting people, but um, so when he was outside originally, we could see him in the video, and my nurse was saying, "His puff daddy." We think you know <laughs> <laughs> this type of thing. So when he came in originally, he says to me, "Hi, um, I'm Michael Jackson." As if I needed to know who he was. Uh, obviously, one of the most recognisable face on the planet and his first words to me were thank you for what you've done for the people of Africa and he took out one of the articles I've written at Silence Savani and he read it out to me and he says you know I cried when I read that and um, I suppose from that we, I treated him for many things including his vitiligo he was black and white um, a lot of people don't realise yeah, that explain so that he, I mean we all we saw him as in the Jackson 5 as yes. a distinctly black yes. man surely uh, so did he did he did he use surgery to whiten himself up or do you think he actually had a skin disorder? Oh, no, I know. I mean, I treated so him for many years. Expert, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I mean, he had his, a skin disorder. His skin was black and white and he depigmented his hands, his feet and his um, face. He, he which? Depigmented. He did that himself? No, we did. Oh, that, you did yeah. that? Yeah. Which mean, in, in layman's terms, depigmentation means you what? You what, is that a whitening thing? Yes, it's yeah. sort of like a bleaching agent, but it's more we were using something to switch off his melanocytes. So that left him susceptible to basal cell skin cancers, which is the reason he wore the mask in the sun all the time. He also suffered from lupus. So as a consequence, he couldn't face the sun either. Oh. So, uh, you know, he should have been more honest with the world. And number one, put yeah. his hand up and said, look, I have vitiligo. And number two, as a consequence of this, I can't go out in the sun so every time he wore an umbrella when he looked a bit you know sort of um, feminine I mean he was doing it to shield himself from the sun Did you ever uh, want, uh, ask him or get into his mind in terms of why he wanted to be white or to but whiten you, himself But he, he wanted to be white because I mean there was either a choice of making his white parts black or his white black parts white I mean many people of Vitalago do this he wouldn't be okay. unusual that way. I mean, the condition is horrendous yeah. from the point of view that when he walked in my surgery first, he took down De Bruyne's, uh, De, De Vivier's dermatology book. It's about 370 pages long. And he came to a page where there was a black child with vitiligo. And, and he turned around and says, nobody knows the pain that that child is going through. And then he pulled up his trouser leg and he showed me that he was totally black and white. And I mean, just like a piebald pony, uh, really. And then sort of um, he, from his neck, down, he was still was like that, so we depigmented him. What and struck it, you about him, Michael Jackson, as a person? Uh, a couple of things, I suppose. His practical joking, his sort of uh, comedic sort of acts, his intelligence to an extent as well, his perfection in, 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 in all he wanted to do, and also uh, there was an incredible loneliness about him, and he felt that America had rejected him, particularly on the night of the WMA Awards. I mean, he wanted to look well for the Queen because at that time also uh, Casino Royale was on, and uh, he, he bottled out of that. That. And despite what the papers had said that he was booed off the stage of the WMA Awards, it, the, the fans actually turned around and really mm. loved him at that. Mm. But he came back and he was very, very dejected and um, he felt that uh, he wasn't going to make a comeback during that period. Was he physically a frail looking person? No, to an extent, um, he sort of used diet pills from time to time, but a lot of dancers do that. I mean, I worked on cruise liners, so uh, I'd be well used to, to that. Uh, type of thing but his heart was strong and certainly um, most of his blood tests and everything would have been um, 
shown somebody with normal health. And you saw the scar from the Pepsi ad burn, didn't you? I mean, did oh, he wear a wig? Was that what it was, his hair, or was his hair He real? did indeed. One day he brought into me a Sunday Times article on um, the Murray twins that had been burnt in that sort of gangland um, affair down in Limerick. In Limerick, yes. And he turned around and said to me, Patrick, are those children in pain? And he wanted to go into Crumlin Hospital where I'd worked. And um, he says... Can you bring me in? But I thought it was. It was too soon after the Santa Maria trial. And he turned around. And what happened in that trial? Well, there was 14, um, I suppose. um, Minors? No, No. uh, cases that, uh, you know, for paedophilia, they were all sort of thrown up by the court as as false. Okay, yes, because there was that sort of um, suspicion. That was just straight after it. And then he had gone to Bahrain and then then he came to Ireland and was living in Ireland in that period. And was Ireland a boat hole for him? Was was he escaping from all that unwanted attention? I think that's fair to say, yeah. yeah. How long was he living here? He lived here for uh, seven or eight months. And you attended his funeral? Yes, so you obviously got close enough to him that you I, I was down at Michael in the house on many occasions. Oh, I put his children to bed with him. Is that right? You know? Yes. And, you know, the first time that I sort of brought one of the children to bed was Blanket. But I thought it was Paris because his hair was so long. And he had put Prince to bed downstairs and his children would turn around saying, I love you, Daddy, and all the rest. Yeah. And at this time, I didn't know really, you know, um, whether he was a paedophile or not. But, I mean, as I grew to uh, see him with his children and grew, to, I suppose, to love him in that way, I knew that he, he couldn't have been. And I'm walking up the stairs with sort of blanket in my hands and I said, she's a lovely child, isn't she? And he says, that's my second son, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, um, yeah, what a wonderful person from the point of view that his humanity was certainly there. I wasn't aware that he had gone into hospitals all the time, so I advised him against going into Crumlin. But um, he did, uh, at the time, take off his wig, showed me where his, he was burnt. I hadn't known that either. Uh, and, you know, cried and said, you know, sort of, I mean, I know the pain that those children are under. Your, your, your business, the Aylesbury Clinic, is, is, is uh, well known. How's business? Is it, is it flying? And has it increased since the recession has tapered off for some? Ah, well, you know, no. we all took a hit during the recession, there's no doubt about it, and we were in expansion phase at that stage and I suppose got caught like everybody else. Um, yes, business is um, back again, almost at the levels that it was in 2007, but um, I suppose some of our expansorial plans in the Middle East were just catching up in them again. Mm. So we've heard clinics now in Saudi Arabia and in uh, India. We've a franchise with 42 clinics there, with the Richfield Group, and in Saudi Arabia. And um, But believe it or not, I always thought the aesthetic side of it rather than the hair transplant yes. would have been the one that would grow. But It's all about the hair. Uh, <clears throat> Patrick Tracy, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. It's Thank quite you, an extraordinary life you've led so far. Uh, the book is called Behind the Mask, The Extraordinary Story of the Irishman Who Became Michael Jackson's Doctor. It's published by Liberties Press, and it's been great to talk to you about that. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Ryan. 